Well, please uh, keep your Bibles open, Ephesians chapter uh, 4, uh, 17 and onwards. Um, just to say that uh, this is our last Ephesians study uh, for this term. Um, we're going to have a few weeks break for the holidays, and then we're going to come back and uh, get back into Ephesians. Uh, why don't I pray and ask the Lord to help us to hear. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your immense grace and mercy to us, that you have not left us in the dark to find our own way, but you have given us the light of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that as we hear your word this morning, that we would hear and that we would be transformed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I recently uh, met um, a couple. Uh, one uh, is an architect, the wife, and the other's a builder. And uh, I was standing on the site of their building, and they were telling me the story uh, of how they um, were erecting this new house of theirs. In fact, it's not far from here. It's just in uh, Musenberg. And the interesting story is that uh, they spent a few million rands buying this particular property which had an old building on it. And uh, because, because they hadn't done their research, they didn't realize that this building was a heritage site. And as they broke it down, uh, the government caught on to it and came to them and told them that they're breaking down a heritage building. They were almost done with the building. And so they were fined a couple million rand. Uh, there's legislation that buildings over 60 years old uh, that are part of the heritage of our country are to be upheld. They're not to be changed. They're to be restored to their former glory. And you want that, don't you? You want a glorious building to be kept in the way that it is because it's precious. It's precious to our heritage. Well, it's the same when we think of the church. Uh, we have this imagery in the Ephesians of the church being the body of Christ, one body together. Uh, but there's also the picture of a building that God has built the church into what it is to this day. And the church is precious, which is why the Apostle Paul last week reminded us that we are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That is, we are to use everything in our power to maintain the unity of the church, the unity that we already have in Christ and through His Spirit. This is a command from God. It's a weighty instruction because what God has created and what God dwells in must not be messed with. Remember chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The church is precious to God, and it should be precious to each one of us. And therefore, we are to make sure that we do everything to protect it. Now, last week, we heard that the way that we do this from verse 16 is that we grow and build one another up in love. And the way that we do this from last week's passage is that we use the gifts that God has given us to serve the body of Christ and therefore grow and strengthen it and keep the unity of the Spirit. In our passage today, there's somewhat of a surprise uh, because it goes from us using our gifts to keep the unity to keeping the unity through godliness. As we actively pursue godliness with one another, so we will grow in love and the unity of the Spirit. And so Paul firstly says to us this morning, cast off the old. The Christian, chapter 4, verse 22, Christian, put off your old self, or more literally, cast off, throw away the old. Remember, the old from chapter 2 of Ephesians was that we were spiritually dead. We were led by our own insatiable desires, by Satan, led and under the wrath of God. The old life was a life of ungodliness. And Paul says to us, 
cast off the old. Get rid of it. He says in chapter 4, verse 17, So I tell you this, and I insist in it on the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. You can hear the weight of what Paul is saying. He doesn't just say, I tell you, don't live as the Gentiles you live. He says, don't, do not, and I insist on it, do not live as the Gentiles do, or don't walk as they walk. At this point in Ephesians, Paul's no longer distinguishing between Jew and Gentile. When he uses the word Gentile, he's talking about anybody who is a pagan. Anybody who does not love God and love his neighbor. And in this passage, he describes this way of life of the Gentile in order to drive home the point that the way of the Gentile is not the way of God. The overarching characteristic, I wonder if you noted there, is in verse 17. The Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. Or as another translation says, the folly of their mind. Verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. In other words, having no light to see the truth of God, they grasp onto their own flawed perspective on what the world is and how it is to work. They have an incomplete uh, picture of the reality of this world and what we are created for. Uh, Think of it like this way. A toddler uh, in a room on its own sees three little holes in the wall, looks at its fingers and realizes, whoa, my fingers fit. It must be for those three holes. And so they put their fingers in. To that child, it makes perfect sense. Three little holes, three little fingers. It must be the way that I'm to do this. But this is futile thinking. Not seeing the bigger picture. Not understanding that behind what they can see is the reality of electricity, which they're soon going to find out about. See, this is the futile thinking of the world. Being alienated and separated from God, we can't see the reality of this world as it is. And so we are led only by our natural instincts. And what this leads us into is ungodliness, unrighteousness. Verse 19 says it this way, Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Verse 22, the old self is corrupted by deceitful desires. The old self is corrupted. Uh, Think about how this reality has played itself out in our world. Uh, Think about nations with superior technology who arrive on the shores of a land with a people who live simply. Their guns give them advantage over the people, and they soon realize that they have power over them. Uh, This power leads them to think that they are superior. And soon, they are oppressing these people, using the people as as a means to gain more and more power and wealth. You see, it's no different from a toddler sticking their fingers in the three holes. What they see and what they experience is not fit for reality that God has created them for. And so they misuse and abuse what they're looking at. You see, if we don't have the light of the truth of God, what we see, what we feel, and what we desire will lead us straight to these desires and instincts. And godliness, and righteousness, living in a way that God did not create us to live. And no doubt we can see this uh, currently playing out in our world's views and practices, uh, specifically around sexuality, economics, education. You name it, the world is sticking the finger in, not understanding that it's created for a very specific purpose. See, this is the way of ungodliness simply living in a way that God did not create humanity for. The old man does this, not just because of ignorance and that they don't have the light of God, but because of their attitudes towards God, verse 18. They are hard-hearted, not wanting anything to do with God and His way. This 
is the old man, which we as God's people are to cast off, to get rid of. We're to have nothing to do with this way of life. Rather, Paul says, we are to clothe ourselves with the new. Verse 24 says, put on, or more accurately, clothe or robe yourself with the new. Uh, The imagery in this passage is entirely appropriate because the gospel message of Jesus is about taking something off us and replacing it by putting something onto us. Uh, Remember that we are covered, we were covered and soaked in dirty sin, which alienated us from God. So Jesus then died on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin and to forgive us so that we can be cleansed from our sin. In other words, that the sin can be cast off from us. Uh, But he didn't leave us in that state, naked. He clothed us with his very own righteousness. Not a righteousness of our own, but as a gift from God to us. In simple terms, when Christ has cleansed us and given us his righteousness... We stand before God as a new creation, accepted by God, belonging to him. It's who we are. We are a new creation created in Christ Jesus. Verse 24, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In other words, like God in godliness. Note the created is past tense. It's who we have been made. It's not something that we need to create. We have been created. And this is an important point in understanding what it means to put off the old and put on the new. See, we are a new creation in Christ. The old has been stripped away. And to live in the old way is to continue to put on old, dirty rags over the beautiful robe of righteousness that God has given to us. But to live consistent with the new righteousness is to display the beauty of our newness. Remember, our newness is not something to achieve. It is who we are. The Christian life is about living out how God has created, to live who you are. That's what Paul's saying here. Christian, live out who God has created you to be. He's not saying, Christian, live in a particular way so that you will be acceptable to God. No, it's the other way around. He has created you new, and now live that reality out. Uh, Perhaps think about it uh, this way. Um, I want you to pretend for a moment uh, that the old person you used to be um, was a convicted criminal. Um, some of This may be reality for some of you. Um, that's great. Jesus saves us all. Um, but what, when you lived out that reality in prison, you wore your orange overalls. You know those orange overalls that... I was going to say that we wish some politicians were in, but that would be rude. Um, the, the orange overalls. Now, just, just imagine that you've served your, your sentence... Um, You've left the prison, but each morning you get up and you put your orange overalls on and you head back to the prison gates, hoping that they will let you back in. Of course, that would be absurd, wouldn't it? And so is the constant returning to the old way of life. As Christians, as a new creation, when we go back to the old, We're going back to something we are not, something that is foreign, and so we must throw it away. But how are we to put on the new? Well, Paul goes back to the reality of our minds. We are to renew our minds. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. This is in contrast to the futile thinking that we had before. You have the light of God, And so allow your mind to be renewed by it constantly. Verse 20, Paul says, That, however, that's the old life, is not the life you you learned. 
when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. See, the Christian life is one that starts with learning and continues with learning. When Christ, the truth, is set before us, we realize, verse 22, of our deceitful desires. We realize our sinfulness when Christ is put before us, and we are driven to him to plead for forgiveness. And he makes us a new creation. But of course, it's, there's an ongoing learning, isn't there, of the truth that transforms the mind, informing us both of the truth of who we are and the reality of the world that we live in. And let's be clear, this is an ongoing process. The renewal of our minds as new creations is a lifelong journey. Uh, when we were first made new by Jesus, we saw in part the reality of our hearts. But as we mature in Christ, we grow a deeper realization of the depth and the extent of our inward sin. And so we need to renew our minds. In some senses, it's our minds that are catching up with the reality of what God has done for us. Our minds are constantly needing to be renewed so that we will remember who we are in Christ. We have to have an ongoing renewal of our minds as we learn the way of Christ. And it requires an ongoing relationship, not just with the scriptures and the Lord, but with one another. You see, there's a reason that last week's passage linked growing in maturity with speaking the truth in love. We need each other to have our minds renewed. We need each other to be pointing out the blind spots in our lives. We need others to encourage us on living for Christ. We need each other to remind us who we are. We need our brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside us and to say, Graham, that's the old man. That's not who you are any longer. Throw it away. Flee from it. Be who you have been created to be. The Christian life is an ongoing, active renewing of our minds and an active pursuit of godly lives. Casting off the old and clothing ourselves with the new is consistent with a godly life. We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about growth. Now, in case we were unsure about what this would look like in the church, the Apostle Paul gives us some very clear examples, verse 25. Therefore, live in this way. In fact, the rest of Ephesians are examples of godly living in the church, in the family, and in the world. See, Christians walk in community. Uh, we're given a number of examples of putting off and putting on. If you read carefully, you will see that there's a bit of a pattern to each of these. Uh, one, there's a negative action. Two, there's a positive action. And three, there's a reason for why you should do this. Now, the first thing that we see is that Christians are to be truthful. Verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, the negative, and speak truthfully to your neighbor, the positive. Why? For we are all members of one body. See, product, uh, falsehood is a product of the old self. It's outright lying. It's withholding the truth, speaking half-truths, cheating, and hypocrisy. In other words, uh, hypocrisy presenting oneself as something that we are not. But this is not who we are. Remember that Satan is called the father of lies. We are the children of God, who is truth. We are to live who we are by speaking truthfully in all things and all situations. And the reason that Paul is giving here is very interesting. You see, Paul could have said, don't lie, tell the truth, because... It's, it's who you are. He could have said, tell the truth because, because God is the God of truth and you want to reflect him, but he doesn't. He says, because you are members of one another. 
In other words, you lie to another Christian, you are lying to yourself. You lie to another Christian, or to anyone for that matter, you're lying to the whole body of believers. And the insidious nature of lying is that it will infect the body and begin to pit one against another. Uh, We could speak for ages on this. But friends, understand this falsehood will destroy the church. Falsehood will divide the unity of the body of Christ. But truth, well, truth will help us to grow in love and remain united as the body of Christ. We protect the unity by telling the truth. And we're also to be self-controlled. Verse 6, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now we all know that anger is a given in life. Uh, Because sin is a given in life. It's the reality. Uh, Sad to say, and let me encourage you this morning, as the body of Christ here at Takai Community Church, it's likely, or it's coming, that somebody at some time will do something that will make you angry. Is that a surprise to you? I'm sure I've made you angry at that point. It will happen. But... We are not to sin in our anger. This is what we do as Christians that counts. See, our natural reaction to being offended is the old person to hit back. But the godly response is not to sin, but rather to be self-controlled. This is particularly countercultural today because open and hostile reactions are not only accepted, but applauded. Uh, How often do you see in the media or perhaps even in your workplace when somebody throws a rant and throws their toys, everybody applauds them because they're standing up for themselves. That's unbecoming of a Christian. In fact, we're, we're we're not just being told to hold back on retaliation, but more positively to seek to address the problem. Don't let the sun go down while you are angry. In other words, deal with it. Uh, This may be dealing with it internally. Uh, It may mean reminding yourself that love covers over a multitude of sin, and we don't have to bring up every little thing. It may be dealing with it relationally, uh, going to the person, expressing how you have felt angry and why. Uh, Perhaps at that moment, when they tell you what happened and why they did it, you will realize actually that you were the person in the wrong. How often is our intense anger actually just hiding the facts of our sin? We always think it's somebody else's problem. But don't let the sun go down on your anger because it may be that your anger is futile, that your anger should not be there. It may just be that you will understand and have a different perspective and so move on from it. Remember, anger held on to is a poison to the mind and continued anger will eventually destroy. In fact, this is Satan's desire, isn't it? It's Satan's way of slipping in amongst God's people. Do not give Satan a foothold by allowing anger to lead you to sin. See, when we are angry with one another, Satan puts his foot in. When we don't deal with that anger, his leg began, begins to sneak in until his whole body is within the body of Christ and there's no coming back because the door is closed. We are to deal with our anger so that we can kick the devil's foot out that door and close it so that the body of Christ remains united. See, this is how the body of Christ keeps and maintains unity in open, honest, and loving conversations that help to put away our anger. We're to be self controlled. We are too to be productive. Verse 28 anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. <clears throat> 
God has created us to be contributors to community, not leeches. As far as it is in our power, we as Christians are to work productively. The goal of this, what Paul tells us, is so that we may have something to share with those in need. You see, genuine need amongst the body of Christ is meant to be met with generous, a generous response to it, to help one another. If we are not productive, we will not have anything to share. And let me just be clear at this point uh, that having something to share is not dependent on the extent of our wealth, but the generosity, rather, of our hearts. We're to be productive so that we can help one another in a time of need. In verse 29, we're also to be encouraging. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Uh, think about our conversations with others. Is what comes out of your mouth building up or breaking down? Uh, how often do we speak about others in a way that creates a negative view of someone else? Uh, how might our conversations perhaps be so self-orientated that we leave very encouraged, but the other leaves with no benefit, or perhaps even discouraged because now they have to measure themselves against the awesome you who have promoted yourself in glory? Do our conversations build others up? Uh, I suppose the question is, could you be described as an encourager? Do you use your words to build others up and to encourage them? When you're having conversations with one another, are you using words that will build up other people? When we talk about somebody else who's not in the room, will that other person leave that conversation encouraged by that person? Or will they leave with a negative view of them? Will we be a people of encouragement? A growing church and a church united is filled with encouragers, not grumblers. Let me say that again. A church that is growing and united is filled with encouragers, not grumblers. We are to be, as the new people of God, encouragers. And finally, we're to be kind and forgiving. Uh, this final example of putting off and on seems to me to be getting to the heart of living in community of new people. In fact, if we apply verse 30, 32, we will be well on our way to growing. Uh, let me read uh, both the, the negative and the positive, starting at verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of of malice. I'm not sure there is a more accurate description of our society today than in these verses. Verse 31. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, malice towards others. But friends, this is not who we are. It is not who we are. Rather, verse 32, we are to be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Isn't it interesting that the Apostle Paul puts kindness, compassion, and forgiveness together? It's interesting because our gut reaction to being offended is to be harsh and lack compassion. It's to judge in a situation, to demand payback, and to stand on our own rights. But Christ's example... God's example is that he forgave freely at a great cost to himself. Friends, just think about the, the forgiveness of God for a moment. The word reminds us that we were once enemies of God, that we hated him, that we were apathetic towards him. And he could have justly just left us in our sin under his judgment. We offended him, and he could have demanded that payment must come from us. And yet, here we sit as people forgiven 
at no cost to ourselves, loved with no boundaries, and embraced by the kindness and compassion of God. In fact, even now, as new creations, when we fail to love God and each other, He, God, still loves us and deals with us in kindness and compassion. See, friends, this is to be the characteristic and experience we have in Christian community. That when we are offended, we deal with people in kindness and compassion and forgiveness. Yes, it costs us. It does. But how much did Christ pay for us so that we could be forgiven? It's a very sad indictment when the church is not uh, seen as kind and compassionate and forgiving. In fact, we're told that it saddens God. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Sin grieves the Spirit of God. And most commentators take this line that when we sin, it grieves God the Spirit. And that's entirely 100%. But I think this is going a bit further. I think that the Spirit of God is deeply grieved when our sin divides the body of Christ. See, divisions in the church is painful because we are a body. And so division is like pulling limbs from a body. In a marriage ceremony, we say what God has brought together, let no one divide. How much more so for the church, who is indwelt by God, who is one, that we should say, may no one ever divide what God has brought together. See, God has built a building that is one in Christ, united with him and with one another. And a church pleasing to God is a church who love one another and are united, forgiving, kind, compassionate, truthful, productive, loving, building one another up. In closing, two thoughts. One, I wonder if our view of the body of Christ is so low and so weak that we have lost the weight of the significance of the church and its unity. Uh, perhaps this is why we are so prone to think of the church as primarily a place for my needs to be fulfilled. And rather than, where, rather than when I seek to love others at my own expense. And maybe this has meant that we are happy to continue in our worldly and ungodly ways as long as we get what we want, get the results we want in the church. Well, friends, the church is God's dwelling place. We are united in Christ. And the precious nature of our unity and love should be protected. And so will we live godly lives in relationship with one another? Will we build up, not break down? Secondly and finally, I wonder if so many of our difficulties in the church could be solved by each of us individually and corporately, committing ourselves and holding one another accountable to godliness. Godliness, not worldliness. Imagine a church speaking about past divisions and current challenges with kindness and love with forgiveness. Imagine a church where no one thinks of the other as them or they or that group of people, but where we talk about one another as family united and loved. Imagine a church where we put off the old and we live out the new. Where we live out the reality of the glorious picture of God united to his people in this world. Perhaps this morning, we each need some self-reflection on our own role in the unity of the body of Christ, the church. Is our godliness and our behavior leading to the building up of the body of Christ, or is it breaking it down?
And as we then reflect, so we should pray. Let's pray. Just take a moment in the silence of your own hearts to reflect on how God has maybe challenged you in response to what we've heard this morning. <clears throat>